consider myself to be an artistic uh, person. <coughs> Explain, please, how you interact in conducting the business affairs of the group. Who do you interact with primarily? Justin Hayward, John Lodge, Wynn Mather, Nicholas Brown, Tony Russell. Tony Russell is? The Moody Blues current attorney in London. And your predominant responsibility is mostly, would it be accurate to say, mostly on the touring side? If that's what we're doing that month. If we're releasing a record, then my responsibility during that period is to coordinate on behalf of the band, because they're signed to an American record company, even though they live in England, to work with the record company, which is in New York and Los Angeles. And you will agree, I believe, that while Patrick was with the Moody Blues on records and touring, he paid an equal percentage along with the other members, except perhaps a lesser percentage on records? I don't know. Of your, of your management royalty? I do not know. We're going to pause because the your deal here. Was with this is the trial on tape, as we've told you before, and we'll come back to this with more of the direct examination of the manager of the Moody Blues. Don't do that. You don't need another nail. You need Handy Hanger, the amazing system that bonds instantly to walls, tile, metal. No holes, no hassles. The testimony of Tom Hewlett, who is the manager for the Moody Blues, and on direct examination so far, he has refused to say which of the Moody Blues he thought was the best musician and to, and to order them, saying that's not something that he deals with. Let's go back to more of the direct examination by Moraz's attorney, Neville Johnson. Because your deal was with, what, Threshold and Talent Corps or Rock on Tours or whatever? You don't know what... Repeat Patrick, the question. Do you know what, if anything, Patrick contributed towards your management commissions? No, I don't. You managed the Moody Blues, right? Correct. Were there, when you managed them while Patrick was with the Moody Blues, did you manage five people or four people or what? Well, I managed... The way my, I guess what I need to do is try to explain what a manager is. All right, if go it's ahead. it's okay. Um, different managers do different things. The way I managed and the way I grew up learning management, and I was very fortunate to work with the best, from Peter Grant, who started Led Zeppelin, to Colonel Tom Parker with Elvis Presley, to Jerry Weintraub with John Denver and Neil Diamond and the Moody Blues. So I probably worked with uh, Roger Forrester with Eric Clapton, Robert Stigwood with the Bee Gees. You've been around. No problem. No, I was able to learn from a lot of people. I chose the way to manage would be to manage the, the name artist and not the individuals because in a band, nobody is equal. And there are, if, if you try to manage individuals you as a manager in my opinion can only lose so i do not manage any individuals in the moody blues i help them if they call me i could give them some advice but i'm not their managers i think that's a very interesting uh view to, to handle it i I'm, i want to now question you and how you do your do your role as a fiduciary. Coral, Coral strike that last comment. Please restrict uh, the comments to questions. All right. You say you don't treat all, all of them equally, right? You don't treat everybody in the band equally? Well, musically, you can't. How about their intra-band relationships? Do you treat them all equally, or, or do you well, treat some unequally? A band is made up of it could be nine individuals in a group like Chicago. It could be three individuals in a group like uh, um, or whoever, uh, Wilson Phillips. Uh, in a group, some members step forward and take on the business aspects of that band. 
Some members wish not to. They trust their partners. So I, I never end up working with an entire band. I usually end up working with the, a part of the band with their office. What, what do you view your... Well, let me ask the question another way, because you didn't answer the question. So I'll ask it another way. What, what do you view the role, let's say in, in a hypothetical situation where there's one band member who's in a weak position business-wise, and the other four want to gang up on him and say, throw him out of the band. What do you view your role is in terms of protecting that weak person? Or do you have any obligation whatsoever? Do you just go with where the majority wants to go? I think I would go with what the band's... My job would be to do what the band wishes unless I really felt it to be totally out of line. And I, then as a human being, I think I would speak up. When did you first learn that uh, the Moody Blues didn't want to have Mraz uh, involved with them anymore? In the winter of 91. And how did you learn that? Uh, Justin Hayward called me in, in my office and stated that the band had had a meeting and that uh, we were gonna, they were going to move forward uh, uh, in a different way. Um, without Patrick, and would I arrange a meeting with Patrick? And I said, if that was my uh, job, uh, it was not the first time I had done a job like that with, with a band member, not only the Moody Blues, but other bands. And uh, I called Patrick, and we had a meeting. Can you, can you pin down the time? No, I can't. You have no notes? No I, no, I don't. How long did your conversation with Mr. Hayward uh, last? Mr. Hayward? Yes. I mean, no, three, five minutes, something like that. Justin Hayward and I talked often, but not long. Recount for us as best you can, word for word, what was said by you and Mr. Hayward concerning the Mr. Moraz on that occasion. I can't recall. Other than the fact it was when I take a meeting with Patrick about uh, uh, him not uh, turning with us this year. What reasons, if any, do you remember that Mr. Hayward expressed as to why they didn't want to work with uh, Moraz? Well, he lived in America. I wasn't surprised with the phone call. So that's the only thing that you remember? Well, uh, that's what I, what's fresh in my mind. The rest I can't recall. Had you ever theretofore told Mraz, you know, you better scoot back to uh, London and start hanging out there because these boys are dissatisfied? No. I mean, he was, um, he was doing his thing. He moved here. It's his choice. So to make this clear, so we have a proper understanding and record then, you don't remember anything else that was said by Hayward about Moraz on that occasion? No, I, I can't recall. No. And all you remember saying is basically, I'll convey the message. Correct. Then you did. I called Patrick up and asked him to come in and have a meeting with me. When? Could have been that day, could have been as soon as I could reach Patrick, I mean within, within days. And he came to your office in Santa Monica? He came to my office in Santa Monica and sat there. And what happened? I said, Patrick, uh, um, I got a call from England, and the guys aren't going to use you this year. But uh, it's pretty understandable because you haven't been part of the band. You've been here. And I, I gave my opinion. And um, we talked for maybe, I don't know whether it was 15 minutes or 30 minutes. Is it that unusual for, well, no, I, I want to stay on the subject. What was Mraz's reaction? I would say it was surprised. 
Well, there you have Tom Hewlett, who is the manager of the Moody Blues. Mark Jacobson, what I'm going to ask you is, at one point, they asked him to rate the Moody Blues as far as who's the better musician, I guess, trying to prove that Moraz is a good musician. He's been in Billboard, in Keyboard Magazine. He's been gotten all these kinds of, that he's one of the musicians of the age as far as keyboardists. And he says, well, I really can't do that. That's not my job as a manager. Is that believable? No. <laughs> frankly. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, I felt it was baloney. His job is to decide who is a good uh, artist and who he's going to manage. He's only going to manage artists that can sell records and can make money. So he's going to know who's a good artist. Certainly this is a good keyboardist. He's in the Moody Blues. And what about his demeanor, the witness's demeanor through the questioning? He, he seemed to have the demeanor that you, if, I was a, if he was my client, I would not want him to have on on this because he seemed to not really be willing to answer the questions, to answer in just, you know, as short as he can, but still not to really be willing to answer the questions. No, he doesn't seem to be cooperating. He seems to be taking a very hard line. He's uh, trying to defend himself and his, his clients as well. I also found remarkable what he said, that he doesn't represent the individual members of the band. He represents the band. But the band is made up of individuals, so who else could he possibly be representing? Who else could he possibly be managing? Now, you, you know the music industry. Tell me this. Is it, is it true that usually one member of the band will become, he said, the kind of the business leader of it, The one member of the band will kind of make the business decisions and kind of come to that, that it just ends up that way, that one takes more interest than the others? Is that what really happens? Yeah. I mean, if you have a band of four or five members or even three members, one or two of them, will take the lead. It's just a, it's a natural evolution in a band. Uh, all, sometimes there is an entire band that works together and makes a decision as a, on a consensus basis, but that's rare. All right, the last question I would have is, uh, the plaintiff's attorney is now doesn't do much cross-examination. What he's going to do is with these witnesses, the Moody Blues witness, he's going to present them during his defense case. Tactically, what do you think of that? Well, I don't think I understand your question. This is, isn't this the plaintiff's lawyer who's asking the questions now? Right, the... right. But the, Mo the Moody Blues attorney is not going to cross-examine oh. the Moody Blues witnesses. He's going to present them as part of his case. Oh, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think the time to put on your case is all at once. Otherwise, um, it loses continuity. And since there's a jury here, making it as simple for them as possible would be the best. And you don't want to counteract some of the things that if perhaps if something damaging comes out on direct examination, you, you wouldn't want to counter it right away? Well, I think you're, it's going to be more forceful the other way because they're your witness and you'll be able to put them on all on your side of the table, not countering them right away. I also think there's not a whole lot that's damaging here that's coming out. So far, at least, yeah. at least from this, this one witness, he didn't say all that much and certainly didn't really prove any point so far as we can see as far as the the, uh, the basis of the lawsuit. Well, we are going to take a short commercial break and we come back with more testimony. We're going to hear from the Moody Blues drummer. Stay with us. I should mention that yesterday when Justin Hayward, who is a member of the Moody Blues, testified, he testified that when they had to fire Moraz, they sent Tom Hewlett to do that job because the rest of the members of the Moody Blues did not want to do it. So now we are going to go to his testimony. I should also mention that part of the claim that Patrick Moraz has against Hewlett is that Hewlett agreed after he was fired that he was going to help him find work, and he says that Hewlett did not do that. Let's go back now to the testimony again, direct examination of the band's manager by Neville Johnson. So we sent all of Patrick's different things over to Japan, trying to get Patrick work in Japan. And that about sums it up in total for everything you did entirely for Patrick Moraz, right? Well, Patrick Moraz, Bob Toll and I made a, made a decision, I believe, just such a yes or no question. Yes or no? It's not a, it's not a yes or no question. You're saying you can't answer? It's not a, it's, I can't answer yes or no. Then, okay, what did you and your office accomplish for Patrick Moraz after he was terminated from the Moody Blues? Ident identify everything you did to advance his career. It wasn't, my, it, wasn't my it wasn't my job to advance his career. It was your job basically to stroke him so he wouldn't sue you, right? Not true at all. What did you tell John and Justin Hayward about everything you were doing to help Patrick Moraz since he'd been terminated by the Moody Blues? 
I didn't tell John Lodge nothing. I called Justin Hayward and asked if he minded if I helped Patrick. What did he say? Uh, no, not at all, Tom. What did you tell him about the problems, if any, that Moraz was having at that time? I don't recall. Do you have a good memory? <clears throat> I think I do. Uh, and at that time, in May of 1990, uh, please identify all the groups that you were managing. A Russian band named Gorky Park, the Beach Boys, um, not managing, consulting, managing or, or consulting, uh, a group called Badlands, uh, the Moody Blues, Warrant. Warrant. And a group called Neverland. <coughs> That's all I can think of. And Warrant and the Moody Blues and the Beach Boys are all huge groups, aren't they? They require a lot of time and attention. When they're working. Or oh, the Moody Blues require no attention when they're not working or very minimal? Very minimal. So were you very busy at that time in May of 1991? May of 1991, yes, I would have been busy. And where did Moraz fall on the list of priorities as to, you know, acts that you were helping to further their career? I, wouldn't, I, I don't think my office does a list of priorities. I think, I think we work on everything conscientiously and, and do a job. And one thing about my kind of office is, is when I'm on... Uh, um, a phone call to Japan, or I send a fax to Japan, the, the fax, uh, fax or phone call might include three different parties on the same fax, because my office is dealing with the party in, in Japan or in Europe uh, also the same way. So you can't give me an answer as to where Mraz was on the order of priority. It was important to me. How important? <coughs> it wasn't my number one priority, but it was important to me. What were you saying? What, how, what, how many priorities were ahead of it? I, can't, I, I, I don't know. And then Moraz, uh, he was trying to call you all the time, wasn't he? Trying to find out what was happening. If he did, I returned his phone calls or Eddie Winrick would have returned his phone calls. We return all of our calls within usually every day. Do you have any uh, phone messages indicating phone calls that you ever returned to Patrick Moraz or Eddie Winrick? I probably do have phone call, phone things somewhere in the office. I don't know. Well, we've requested them. We haven't seen them. Well, I don't know. Maybe uh, I don't. Did you ever promise Moraz you were, go you were going to try and get him soundtrack work? We made an attempt to. Eddie Winrick went to um, several different, what I call, I don't know what I don't know what you'd call them, but several several different people in the soundtrack business who work with directors and producers on music for film. And there was no business, right? Did we get any? Right. I don't remember. Well, you would. Did he have opportunities? I don't know because I had Eddie Winrick doing this. Oh, so you didn't do it. Winrick did it. Correct, because those were his contacts because of his growing up in Epic as an A&R person. Could you identify for me exactly the names of the companies that Winrick reportedly approached on behalf of Moraz vis-a-vis soundtracks? Well, I know. I can only. Uh, I know one, Tim Sexton, and he had a girl named Becky Mancuso with him at the time who worked for several different studios. I know he went to David Kirschenbaum, who is a producer of Tracy Chapman and other people who joined a company called Morgan Creek. Those for sure I know he went to. I don't know who else. How do you know he went to those two places? I remember him telling me he had meetings with him, and we used to go to them about everybody. Well, there's, and you'd run by other clients at those meetings too? Well, we, sure, they would call us for uh, music. 
So you'd be pitching Beach Boys, Warrant, Neverland, Moody's as well. And right? Patrick was fortunate to be put in the same bag. Correct. Do you have any documents that indicate the, the pitching of Moraz to those companies? No, but you can sure call them as witnesses. Well, I'm just hearing about them for the first time, and I may try. Good. Um, did you, you testify that you tried to get Moraz on the Yes Tour, too, didn't you? Yes. Who did you call? You called a man named Larry Maggot? <coughs> yes. And he said, sorry, it's all booked up. We don't need any more people for Yes, right? No, he did not say it that way. What did he say? Uh, Larry Maggot I've known for 25 years. He's the biggest producer in the city of Philadelphia of shows and he was written up in uh, one of the trade magazines as the producer of the of a new Yes tour. Uh, I didn't know Larry to be doing those kind of things so I called Larry up and I said hey Larry I just read about the uh, uh, Yes tour you're doing um, are you interested in Patrick Moraz? He says why? You aren't using him? No he's not going to be in the Moody Blues tour this year. He said let me check I'll call you back. Called me back either within two days and said, no, I checked. They aren't going to need him. They're, it's all full up. Okay. Um, were you aware at any time that Moraz had been instructed by the Moody Blues that he was only to talk business between the Moody Blues by the utilization of lawyers as intermediaries? No. Have you ever listened to Patrick Moraz's work? Yes, I listened to one, probably two or three pieces of work going to and from um, my office and my home. And Eddie Winrick and I listened to two or three different pieces of work in his office um, when he brought in all, all of the, his projects. It's beautiful, isn't it? Beautiful music. It's nice music. I, it's not my type, but it's nice. Patrick's uh, accountant with Touche Ross. When did you learn who David Moss was? When I was going through um, I don't know what you got, what you call them, um, some of the files of the deposition. Do you remember David Moss writing to you and telling you that in uh, 1988 that uh, Moraz was tired of being a poor relation and wanted to achieve parity, get his 20% on the albums? No, I don't. Let me show you a copy of this uh, letter. sure I got this letter, but I don't remember getting it at the time. And you don't remember... You don't remember it now? <coughs> well, this is the kind of thing that uh, was standard procedure with Patrick and uh, the Moody Blues every time we worked. Well, did it personally bother you or offend you that Moraz was asking for an equal share? Not at all. In fact, it wouldn't hurt you if your share got increased, right? It wouldn't hurt what? My you wouldn't share, mind it if you got my more. share. My share didn't get increased, and it wouldn't have gotten increased. Uh, so it wouldn't have mattered to me. There was some business about a, uh, some gentlemen called uh, Billy Mack and Alan Hewitt, H-E-W-I-T-T. -T. Who were they? 
Billy Mack and Alan Hewitt are two keyboard players. I know Alan Hewitt. I do not know Billy Mack. They were two keyboard players that somehow we had tapes of in our office through Eddie Winrick. Uh, and, and you had given them, then they, they were based in L.A., weren't they? Alan I know Hewitt. Alan Hewitt as I don't know where Billy Mack lives. And you pitched Alan Hewitt to the Moody's. Uh, in, uh, in in May on May 29th, 1991, didn't you? Sent him a fax or something. Ask me the question over again. Do you remember ta having communications with the Moody's in late May of 1991 about Alan Hewitt? Not specifically. Didn't you try and get Mraz back into the Moody's uh, at one point in about in or about May of 91? No, I did not. Do you deny then having a conversation with myself and Bob Thal, a joint conversation in which you discussed the possibility of Mraz's rejoining the Moody's? No, but you just asked me if I tried to. Yeah. Did you try? No, I did not. That's the end of the examination of Tom Hewlett, at least for the present time. He is not going to be cross-examined by the Moody Blues attorney at this point. The attorney is waiting until he presents his own case on defense. Well, Mark, one thing that struck me is the way this examination went at one point where he's talking about the fact that he tried to help Moraz get work after he was dismissed from the Moody Blues, and he says, the witness says to the attorney, you can sure call them as witnesses, and the attorney says, it's the first I heard of it. I may just call them, and the, and the witness goes, good. Astonishing. Is that, is that any kind of direct examination like you've ever seen? No, or it's a, totally unprepared. It's amazing that he would go through and even ask a question to which he didn't know the answer. He should have known the answer well before he asked the question. And also this conversational nature. I mean, isn't that something basically in law school that they tell you not to do? You don't sure. have a conversation. You're, you're supposed to be in control. Right, eliciting information that you need or that you, to which you already know the answers. The information that you need. You ask the question to which you already know the answer. No other questions. Now, there was a lot of emphasis placed in the questioning on how good a musician Patrick Moraz was. At one point, the attorney asked, uh, well, you heard his music. It's beautiful, isn't it? And he conceded that it was nice, not his taste. Is that important, how good he, a musician he is? I mean, isn't it a fact that this is a band and they want to play with whoever they get along with, perhaps, or, and that it doesn't really matter if he's a, the best musician in the band or maybe a mediocre musician in the band? Well, there's band. a couple of things going on. I think the questions they were talking about is his ability as a composer, which is different from his ability to be a keyboardist. And his mm -hmm. ability as a keyboardist, as a musician, is something that you can, is fungible. You can buy somebody who's a good keyboardist. You don't necessarily have to get along. If he's going to help write the songs, and they all have to have a similar vision of life and the world and each other and love and marriage and all those things. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. So I, I think what they were trying to elicit in the earlier part of the testimony was whether, was whether he was a competent musician and able to do his job. And what Hewlett was saying is, I don't know. And that's what's baloney. And whether he's a good composer or not is a matter of personal taste. What about the fact that we have articles where he actually criticized the Moody Blues, uh, Mraz, as saying that, you know, they're kind of stagnant, they're not doing what he wanted to do, and this was before he was fired, and perhaps the group didn't want him around because of that. You know, there's a member of the band, or at least in his view, a member, or certainly a session musician, even in their view, and maybe they don't want someone around who's going to criticize them in the press. Uh, that probably has something to do with it, but if he has a contract, then there's no reason that they can fire him. That's not enough of a reason to fire him, mm -hmm. I need to say. Well, we're going to take a commercial break, and when we return, we are going to hear from the drummer of the Moody Blues, so stay with us. <laughs>
Keyboard Magazine has called Patrick Moraz one of the principal multi-keyboardists of the age. The Moody Blues are known as a super group. They have sold more than 30 million albums in their 28 years in the music business. Moraz and the Moody Blues seem to be a good match. Moraz played keyboards on albums and tours with the group for more than a decade. But in 1991, the Moody Blues fired Moraz. The group claims Moraz was nothing more than a session man under contract. But Moraz says he was much more. He claims he was made a permanent equal sharing member of the group, and he's suing them for nearly $4 million for firing him. Let's return to the courtroom now where one of the Moody Blues drummer, Graham Edge, is on the stand. Do you have an oral agreement with the Moody Blues that you cannot be fired? of Tom Hewlett, who is the manager for the Moody Blues, and on direct examination so far, he has refused to say which of the Moody Blues he thought was the best musician and to, and to order them, saying that's not something that he deals with. Let's go back to more of the direct examination by Moraz's attorney, Neville Johnson. Because your deal was with, what, Threshold and Talent Corps or Rock on Tours or whatever? You don't know what repeat Pat the question. Do you know what, if anything, Patrick c contributed towards your management commissions? No, I don't. You managed the Moody Blues, right? Correct. Were there when you managed them while Patrick was with the Moody Blues? Did you manage five people or four people or what? Well, I managed the way my could. I guess what I need to do is try to explain what a manager is. All right, go it's ahead. It's okay. Um, different managers do different things. The way I managed and the way I grew up learning management, and I was very fortunate to work with the best, from Peter Grant, who started Led Zeppelin, to Colonel Tom Parker with Elvis Presley, to Jerry Weintraub with John Denver and Neil Diamond, and the Moody Blues. So I probably worked with... Uh, Roger Forrester with Eric Clapton, Robert Stigwood with the Bee Gees. You've been around. No, problem. no, I was able to learn from a lot of people. I chose the way to manage would be to manage the the name artist and not the individuals because in a band nobody is equal. And there are if if you try to manage individuals, you as a manager, in my opinion, can only lose. So I do not manage any individuals in the Moody Blues. I consider myself to be an artistic uh, person. <coughs> Explain, please, how you interact in conducting the business affairs of the group. Who do you interact with primarily? Justin Hayward, John Lodge, Wynn Mather, Nicholas Brown, Tony Russell. Tony Russell is the Moody Blues current attorney in London. And your predominant responsibility is mostly, would it be accurate to say, mostly on the touring side? If that's what we're doing that month. If we're releasing a record, then my responsibility during that period is to coordinate on behalf of the band, because they're signed to an American record company, even though they live in England to work with the record company, which is in New York and Los Angeles. And you will agree, I believe, that while Patrick was with the Moody Blues on records and touring, he paid an equal percentage along with the other members, except perhaps a lesser percentage on records? I don't know. Of your, of your management royalty? I do not know. We're going to pause because the tape your deal here. Was with this is the trial on tape, as we've told you before, and we'll come back to this with more of the direct examination of the manager of the Moody Blues. No, don't do that. You don't need another nail. You need Handy Hanger, the amazing system that bonds instantly to walls, tile, metal. No holes, no hassles. The testimony. I help them. If they call me, I could give them some advice, but I'm not their managers. I think that's a very interesting uh, view to, to handle it. I, I want to now question you 
and how you view your, view your role as a fiduciary. Carl, Carl will strike that last comment. Please restrict uh, his comments to questions. All right. You say you don't treat all, all of them equally, right? You don't treat everybody in the band equally? Well, musically, you can't. How about their intra-band relationships? Do you treat them all equally, or, or do you well, treat some unequally? A band is made up of, it could be nine individuals in a group like Chicago, it could be three individuals in a group like uh, um, or whoever, uh, Wilson Phillips. Uh, in a group, some members step forward and take on the business aspects of that band. Some members wish not to. They trust their partners. So I, I never end up working with an entire band. I usually end up working with the, a part of the band with their office. What, what do you view your, let me ask the question another way, because you didn't answer the question. So I'll ask it another way. What, what do you view the role, let's say in, in a hypothetical situation where there's one band member who's in a weak position business-wise, and the other four want to gang up on him, and say, throw them out of the band. What do you view your role is in terms of protecting that weak person? Or do you have any obligation whatsoever? Do you just go with where the majority wants to go? I think I would go with what the band's, my job would be to do what the band wishes, unless I really felt it to be totally out of line. And I, then as a human being, I think I would speak up. When did you first learn that uh, the Moody Blues didn't want to have Mraz uh, involved with them anymore? In the winter of 91. And how did you learn that? Uh, Justin Hayward called me in, in my office and stated that the band had had a meeting and that uh, we were gonna, they were going to move forward uh, uh, in a different way. Um, without Patrick, and would I arrange a meeting with Patrick? And I said, if that was my uh, job, uh, it was not the first time I had done a job like that with, with a band member, not only the Moody Blues, but other bands. And uh, I called Patrick, and we had a meeting. Can you, can you pin down the time? No, I can't. You have no notes? No I, no, I don't. How long did your conversation with Mr. Hayward uh, last? Mr. Hayward? Yes. I mean, no, three, five minutes, something like that. Justin Hayward and I talked often, but not long. Recount for us as best you can, word for word, what was said by you and Mr. Hayward concerning the Mr. Moraz on that occasion. I can't recall. Other than the fact it was when I take a meeting with Patrick about uh, uh, him not uh, touring with us this year. What reasons, if any, do you remember that Mr. Hayward expressed as to why they didn't want to work with uh, Moraz? Well, he lived in America. I wasn't surprised with the phone call. So that's the only thing that you remember? Well, uh, that's what I, what's fresh in my mind. The rest I can't recall. Had you ever there to four told Mraz, you know, you better scoot back to uh, London and start hanging out there because these boys are dissatisfied? No. I mean, he was, um, he was doing his thing. He moved here. It's his choice. So to make this clear, so we have a proper understanding and record then, you don't remember anything else that was said by Hayward about Moraz on that occasion? No, I, I can't recall. No. And all you remember saying is basically, I'll convey the message. Correct. Then you did. I called Patrick up and asked him to come in and have a meeting with me. When? Could have been that day, could have been as soon as I could reach Patrick, I mean within, within days. And he came to your office in Santa Monica? He came to my office in Santa Monica and sat there. 
and what happened? I said, Patrick, uh, um, I got a call from England, and the guys aren't going to use you this year. But uh, it's pretty understandable because you haven't been part of the band. You've been here, and I, I gave my opinion. And um, we talked for maybe, I don't know whether it was 15 minutes or 30 minutes, 